Okay. This is the book. And I'm so honored that um, I've been given this opportunity in, in the book week to um, lead off and to present the week. So uh, thank you so much for the Architect Foundation and, um, and the United Workers. So um, let me just uh, give a short synopsis of the book. It's, it's a collection of essays that I've written um, over the last 10 years, but mostly the last seven years, um, that I would say fall into two, two categories. Um, one, one we could identify as um, ideological critiques and the others would be institutional critiques. And the ideological critiques are, are ones that have to do with the larger conceptual nature of architectural work. Um, and so these have to do with thinking about um, what work versus leisure is, um, how that's distinguished and whether creative work means that we don't have to think about leisure. Um, how does architectural work relate to craft? Um, is architectural design the same as craft? Um, it also has to do with questions of how work is organized and how it relates to radical democracy. Um, so those, those are kind of, yeah, what I would call um, ideological critiques. Other essays have to do with more what I would call investigative work. You know, that's the institutional critique. Um, I think those essays for the most part were um, a product of the deeper work that I was doing with the architecture lobby um, around why, why is our, our work uh, formulated and structured in such a crappy way? Um, you know, and so this leads to critiques of our architectural association, the AIA, um, critiques of, of contracts that I think um, keep us um, apart from construction labor and um, embed in us antagonistic relationships. Uh, investigations of other countries, architectural professional organizations to see whether, well, architecture might learn from other countries who might be doing it better, but basically teaches us how embedded all these institutions are in national ideologies um, and interests in national hegemony. You can't pull, pull the associations out from their own, their own economic and government system. Um, and um, yeah, so I think, I think there is that kind of um, division between the essays. They, in some way they're chronological, kind of starting from uh, the ideological moving into the institutional and then pulling back out again. Um, in the midst of that, there are also essays about forming cooperatives um, and uh, one about the history of the, the most um, constructive union in the US, Architects Union, and speculating about what it means for unions today. Um, so the cooperatization and union ones are sit somewhere between the ideological essays and the institutional essays. Um, so this, this comes from um, the end of the essay that's on unionization, which, which has been fairly historical about the union. It's called um, the Federation of um, Architects, Engineers, Chemists, and Technicians. You know, F A E C T. Um, and and then what I'm going to be reading is is kind of the more contemporary questions that have to do with that. But I, but because um, I worry that this is very American centric. I also, I, also, I also want to just preface this by saying um, that there is uh, an organization fairly similar to FAECT um, in the UK um, called the, um, it's AASTA, which is the um, uh, Association of Architects, Surveyors and Technical Assistants, um, which was a union that lasted from 1924 to 1942, which is very similar to the period of, of FACET. Um, but what's interesting is how very similar that union in its relationship to RIBA 
is to facets in relationship to the AIA, um, which is to say essentially um, the tensions between the um, ASTA, as I will call it, and RIBA was fought over a number of issues similar to ours with FACET, licensure that discriminated over the technically trained, vertical structures in the office that subordinated the draftsmen, a, sustain, a disdain for the construction industry, fairness um, in the workplace, um, and implicit discrimination between private and public work. Um, I have this quote, which I think is interesting and, and is so analogous to quotes that I could come up with facet, um, but this was um, expressed by Leslie Nash, who was in, in ASTA and it's you know, about RIBA. So the quote is, there is the question of propaganda which goes on within the schools, in private offices, and in all sorts of ways. The aim of this propaganda is to foster in every conceivable way the idea that private practice is the only form of practice worthwhile. The competition systems helps this idea as an in, and is intended to convince every student that he will soon be a private practitioner and that he needs think of nothing else. Let us be quite clear that there is no question of reforming RIBA or expecting the leopard to change its spots. So um, with that kind of background, which I hope allows you to um, think about what I'm about to read, you know, which is in relationship to, um, to FACET, you know, to think about as, as analogous to issues that have come up in your union past. So here I go. The Federation can be understood as a result of conditions particular to its era and therefore unrepeatable. The Great Depression and World War II not only created professional precarity that needed a labor response, but also provided a universal employer, the US government, against which architectural employees could unite. But precarity still exists and collective bargaining remains viable for architects employed in offices. Architects still have no say over fees, wages, schedules, or the programs or the projects they work on. Education is still elitist and expensive. The architectural industry is still stymied by its dysfunctional relationship to the construction industry. And the AIA does nothing to change our lot. Architects are ever more confused about our status as laborers in the 21st century. Immaterial workers, creative workers, knowledge workers, 99% workers, these are all sirens of entrepreneurialism, which implies that competing as individual freelancers is the source of innovation. But we are slowly waking up to the fact that collective bargaining has been essential to advancing the productive reach of all creative industries. In the United States, outside of architecture, unions and guilds and other creative professional organizations abound the Screen Actors Guild, the Writers Guild of America, the Directors Guild, the American Society of Composers, et cetera, et cetera. And outside of the United States, architectural unions are common. In Scandinavia, architectural associations are all unions. In France, despite a major organiza architectural organization co company that is very much about the hegemony of um, French uh, cultural labor, there is a union of national des syndicats Ar um, francais architecture, um, which advocates for, for architecture's value in society for fair fees, procedures, and laws. In Germany, the chambers of the architect and commerce, while not technically unions because they are public private associations, provide pensions and determine fee schedules, they're called Hoyas that protect architects from market-driven precarity. But before we can consider contemporary unionization in architectural practice, the ongoing ideological tensions evident in FACET, which the preceding part of this essay has described, needs to be examined. The first is our unsolved attitude towards professional exceptionalism. In the 1920s, 1930s, and 40s, the term technical was not antithetical to professionalism. Rather, it was aligned with the most progressive form of professional knowledge, scientific management. This movement understood that both employers and unions 
we're inefficient, and we're, self, we're self-interested obstacles to the running of good society. What was problematic for the architects in FACET was his threat to disciplinary autonomy. Immediately after FACET was formed in 1933, a group split off from it to form the Architectural Guild of America. The Guild believed that union organization was necessary, but felt that architecture was its own sui generis craft-based discipline and disagreed with the Federation's inclusion of other workers. The Guild versus Federation split presents the same tension we struggle with today. Do we perform intimate, personal, and sui generis activities that preclude labor alignments? Or do we operate in the context of industrialization and workers that organize around that kind of work? The second ideological tension has to do with professional hierarchies. Membership in FACET, as in all US unions, was limited to employees. Even in journals such as Pencil Points, a rank and file magazine for architectural draftspeople, the editorial statements expressed a fear of undoing the intimate, and we might say paternalistic, bond between employer and employee. The editors wrote, we do not believe that a labor union will be the most effective type of organization for the purposes in view. Not that we have anything against labor unions as such, but it is distinctly our feeling that such action would not tend to bring back the close cooperation between architects and draftsmen, which we deem to be necessary in the best interest of both. The close cooperation is precisely what allows architectural workers to feel unable to articulate displeasure with conditions that work exclusively for firm owners. The third ideological tension involves our political courage. The Federation showed architects to be both radical and withdrawn, which is to say they described that the most radical organizers were the architects in that group. However, they were the most politically resistant, which is to say their refusal to identify as a radical party, as communist or as socialist, despite the number of communists in the union might have been strategic, but the inability to link an economic concern with a political concern indicates an essential fear of politicizing architecture that still exists today. And of course, the fourth tension intertwined in all the previous ones concerns the issue of class. Exceptionalism or reformist technician, professional organization or labor, liberal or radical, ambivalence about class, the members' reliance on the blue collar tactic of unionization, the members' resistance, all has to do with class and our worries about it. Today, more than ever, the issue of unionization resides within a general systemic failure to think in terms of class in the US. Anyway, indeed, a particular architectural failure is involved in admitting that we may not be of the same economic class as our patrons or acknowledging that our economic precarity precludes us from our desired social station read professional intelligentsia in life. This same failure ensures that we do not take positions that would alleviate that precarity. Awareness of FACET and its positive contributions to the field at a time when our professional organization was looking the other way may not convince us, those of us practicing, studying, and teaching architecture that unions can solve the problems in our discipline but it draws attention to the fact that the automatic dismissal of unionization in our field stems not from structural impossibility or even from the practical difficulties of organizing within private and often very small firms. Rather, the Federation has shown within its internal debates how embedded our sense of privilege is and how slow we are to come to grips with the nature of our labor. Thank you, Peggy. Um, that was actually a passage that I looked at a lot and highlighted lots of passages of, so I think there's a lot of relevance for our experience here as well. Um, before we go on to um, a discussion, uh, we just wanted to uh, present a few slides about ourselves uh, first to the audience. So I'm just going to share my screen. I 
Aska, when you're ready. Hi, I'm Aska. And I'm Curti. We're members of United Voices of the World, section of Architectural Workers, or we say SAW for short. SAW is a trade union for architectural workers in the UK. Members of SAW support and upskill each other to make the architectural sector fairer for workers, communities and the environment. We're going to talk briefly about what SAW is, how we formed and how we work. SAW formed out of an 18 month workers inquiry process after a group of architectural workers and students realized that a union would be a useful tool to address issues they were experiencing in the workplace and at university. They held open meetings, conducted surveys and interviews, did archival research of past efforts to unionize and collectively surveyed the architectural sector from below. This process developed SAW's analysis of architectural work categorized under five headings. So in no particular order, the issues architectural workers face are overwork, unstable employment, pay, <laughs> office culture and ethics. Sorry about the delay. Um, all these issues were not caused by the pandemic. However, COVID-19 has certainly exposed and heightened existing structural issues within the architectural sector and sort of brought them to the fore. So in September 2019, following the workers' inquiry, we joined the radical and grassroots trade union, United Voices of the World, UVW for short. UVW is a members-led trade union who have won significant victories for previously considered ununionizable workers. These include outsourced cleaning and security staff, gig economy workers, domestic violence workers, sex workers, and more. Importantly, UVW see the value in workers driving their own campaigns. We're not a big bureaucratic union which acts mainly as a service line or an advice line. We're a radical community of workers who support one another to develop and empower each other to take collective action. So this is a really good example of a really big UVW victory from last year in 2019, which was won through collective action. Um, St Mary's Hospital in London were outsourcing its 1,000 cleaners, caterers and porters via a multinational company called Sodexo. Um, as a result of this procurement route, the outsourced staff lacked the benefits of an NHS contract and were being underpaid, overworked and disrespected. Um, Imperial College NHS Trust, NHS Trust sorry, were compelled after nine days of strike action and three months of UVW campaigning to directly employ all these workers, giving them a pay rise in line with their NHS colleagues and honoring holiday and sick pay. The NHS nurses and doctors supported their striking colleagues, standing in solidarity with workers outside their professional silos. The negative health effect for hospital patients, as well as the structural racism of the procurement system, were also exposed as additional issues that in-housing could address. So the model of union that we're interested in does not seek to be a third party acting on behalf of its members. On the contrary, the union is the vehicle of work empowerment. It enables workers to autonomously negotiate their professional conditions without relying on external or institutional bodies. It's also important to note that our architectural workers branch includes all workers involved in and necessary to the production of architecture. The draftspeople, assistants, the office cleaners, administrative staff, clerk of works, security guards, receptionists, technicians, BIM managers, document controllers, the list goes on. So through our union, we upskill each other and develop the resources necessary to organize collectively so that we can affect the changes that we want to our working conditions to society and the environment. So in, in concrete terms, essentially what we do is we set up worker to worker solidarity processes. We hold training sessions on employment law and workplace organizing. We develop our connections to other organizations and campaigns to support them and find a common ground. 
we map the profession and develop the appropriate language and tools to navigate existing power structures. And very importantly, we broadcast our voices to inspire other workers to take action for themselves and in solidarity with others. So in the current moment, the challenges presented by COVID-19 and the correspondent economic fallout have really impacted architectural workers and have made collective empowerment and unionizing all the more necessary. As workers, we feel ever more precarious, separated from the traditional forms of face-to-face -face connection, which organizing is built on. This pandemic, SOARS members have tackled cases of sex, discrimination, disability discrimination, race and mental health discrimination, unfair pay cuts, furlough fraud, and unfair dismissal. So bosses are taking the opportunity to extract profits while workers are isolated and vulnerable as renters in their employment and with their health. So building connections of solidarity amongst workers despite the distance and creating spaces to act together is, crit is critical now, perhaps more than ever. So continuing in the spirit of making connections and sharing with fellow workers across the globe, we're really excited to be in conversation tonight with Peggy. Thanks, Aska. Um, so, yes, th thanks, Peggy, for, for being in conversation with us. I suppose we're really delighted to, to speak to you today about your new book because we read it with great interest and there's uh, very little, actually, that's written on the topic. So that's partly why we think it's really interesting uh, to talk about labour and the contemporary architectural industry. And also because there's many themes that you discuss in the book that we encounter in our sort of work as, as trade unionists. So. One aspect perhaps that we wanted to start with, um, which you discuss in one of the initial chapters, the one called architectural work, where you introduce the term work aphasia, uh, and you describe that as a condition um, that you assign to architects, which is a sort of inability or perhaps reluctance, you've kind of mentioned it in your reading, an inability to recognize ourselves as workers or the activities that we carry out as work. Um, and that's something we've always felt quite strongly about um, in, our, in our work with UVW. So um, it's quite important to the way we think of what we do as a trade union, right? That we're indeed workers, not necessarily professionals or belonging to professional, professional group. So um, maybe before we can talk about the, the benefits of that term worker, in your view, what, why do you think our industry suffers from this work aphasia? And it's not just kind of happening at an institutional level, it's also right down to almost personal behaviors. Yeah. And if you could say a few words about that. Um, I think it comes from um, the worst possible mix of professionalism and um, art making. Um, and so the side of us that thinks that we do art um, thinks that our, our time at the desk isn't work, it's creativity. Um, so that comes from that part. Um, the professional side su su suggests that we're doing um, specialized um, things. Um, you know, it's, it's called in, in our governance, the learned professions. And the learnedness of that um, makes us think that we operate at a larger um, intellectual and cultural plane. Um, and so when those two come together, uh, you can see that um, one would think that time at the desk um, isn't equal to a plumber, you know, unplugging our toilets. Um, it's, not, it's not work. It, it speaks to a higher calling that's called creative intelligentsia in, in some way. Um, and, and then I think the institutional side of this plugs in, you know, whether that's academia that, you know, sets us off on that, on that road, or whether it is the office structure itself and the fact that we're still in some way this apprenticeship thing. It's like, even though I've been through three years of school at the master's level and four years before that and spent $200,000, I'm still sitting at the knee waiting for the pearls. I don't know anything, please abuse me. Um, you know, I don't need to describe it to you. But. 
yeah it's, it's really interesting the way you've described that it's it's something you learn at school so there's, there's definitely a kind of institutional dimension to this but somehow we sort of embody that personality when when we sit at our desks and uh, um, there's definitely a degree of of what we do uh, in the union in having these discussions and trying to shift these notions of our of our identity as professionals slash workers um, well I, I think that kind of leads into the, the second maybe question we wanted to discuss but in, in your view, and that maybe relates a little bit uh, to your activist work with the architectural lobby, but how, how do you think fighting against work aphasia and promoting this notion of architectural worker or architect as a worker, to, to use a, a word from a previous book of yours, um, is that a good strategy or a good starting point to obtain sort of the working conditions that we might want as, as architectural workers? I mean, what, what, what can we achieve, as it were, by tackling that. You mean what, what can an activist organization like the lobby or a union organization like yours, what can we achieve? Is, is that? Yes, and, and whether, whether it should be achieved through, the, through this beginning perhaps by changing the nomenclature like this. Yeah, yeah. Um, I actually think it happens at a number of levels um, and certainly one is institutional, you know, that, that we need to, um, I mean, I'm, I'm for deprofessionalization. I don't think we should be a professional. I think it's, it's, it's a problem. Um, and so how do we actually argue, um, you know, with your licensing board and accreditation board and, you know, the fraternal organization of RIBA, how does one argue for um, a different way of thinking about our value? Um, but I also think, and I think this is you know, part of what you're trying to hit home, um, it does have to do with your identity that works at a subjective level. Um, you, you have to get to a place where you think differently about yourself in the role, in the world, your hours spent away from your family, doing those things that you do. You have to think differently about it. And I think that is the role of um, theory. I just, I just have to say, I think theory plays a huge role in this. Um, and organizations or even even meetings like this that maybe don't fit into um, academia where you'd be reading theory or practice where you'd be learning about um, other other modes of engagement with your colleagues and you know your bosses and the construction workers um, that pry open um, new concepts of identity. Um, and I do, I do have to say that I think non-architectural activism, whether it's Black Lives Matters or, you know, whether it, the Me Too movement, um, are doing that work as well um, in shoving us away from um, our very known um, and very circumscribed notions of self. Um, embedded privilege, um, you know, all, all of those things. So, yeah. Yeah, I think what, what you said as well there, that, that it needs to happen through theory. I think that's a really interesting point that um, activism somehow also requires that degree of historical theoretical research. And, and um, you know, the, what you presented today um, about the, the FACET group, um, the American uh, trade union from the 1930s and how you relate to that to our British AASTA. I mean, we've certainly also done union in, uh, research into AASTA and, and the later incarnations as, as NAM, um, New Architectural Movement of the 60s. And um, there's definitely a great kind of, a lot of lessons to be learned from, from looking at previous examples and sort of finding the um, things that we have in common with these past workers, but also what worked and what didn't work in, in their case to sort of learn how to move forward. So there's an interesting kind of balance, I suppose, between what might be considered as architectural academic research perhaps and architectural activism on the other. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. And just to say, you know, I, I think um, that the activism um, hopefully is getting to students who will demand in, in their schools other kinds of lessons than the ones that we've been given. Um, so that there's that exchange that comes from those of you who are 
paying for education, making sure that you're getting the education that you feel will actually make you um, relevant and productive. And in some way, I guess we could say that, you know, in relationship to architectural employees and architectural workers, that they begin to probe questions with their bosses about why they're being given the work that they do, why the office itself takes the projects that it does, um, and, and set those questions in relationship to, um, you know, the things that matter in our environment, in our workplace culture, all, all of those things. Yeah, so I guess kind of looking, looking at history or you also look at um, a sort of real analysis of other nations, professional architectures, architectural associations, and that kind of serves as this, you know, um, exercise of con kind of contrast and, and comparing. And I'm wondering, you know, you set out at the beginning of that chapter to kind of go through, compare, look at whether each um, professional organization and the country's relationship to sort of innovation or architectural heritage, unionization. But by the end of that chapter, you set aside that exercise, exercise of, compar on, of comparison and you kind of point towards it, in fact, being a nationalist project that architecture in every country is complicit with. So I'm wondering, would you be able to expand on that relationship a little bit between architecture, nationalism and, and labor? Um, yeah, I mean, you've, you've done such a good description of it, but um, when I went into it, you know, I, you know, thinking that the AIA that is totally irrelevant, you know, it's, and, you know, it gives awards to ourselves and it sells contracts, you know, and then its job is to kind of make sure that there are more members so that you can keep doing more awards and sell more contracts. It, um, you know, it, it, were there other examples? And certainly one of the things that we learned in that, or what I learned in that, is that the fact that the U.S. is, almost all construction is private, means that architects and, and the AIA have no relationship to the state, other through licensure. Um, and licensure just kind of follows rules. And that other countries have a much more embedded, or other associations have a much more embedded relationship to the state, um, which I think is important. Um, you know, we, we could worry about statism and, you know, the, the fact that that kind of connection can tell architecture to do certain things, but, but in fact, I think it's a two-way street that um, if the country is interested in the quality of its built environment, um, they will actually want to listen to those who are producing the built environment. Um, so the state aspect of this is, is, is quite interesting. Um, but, you know, part of it also is whether these different organizations um, argue for employees as well as employers, you know, and so in some way it's, it's an issue of whether really architecture, architectural works are being represented in, in these different organizations. And it's shocking to find that really it's only Germany and Sweden or Scandinavia, I'm using Sweden as an example, that actually recognize employees within that discussion, which I find <laughs> unbelievable. Um, and so, you know, and then, and then we go to Sweden where so much of it is right, you know, which is that the main professional organization is, um, is a union of employees, um, you know, and also that there's this very intimate relationship between unions um, and the government. And so it's not just that unions represent employees, they, they enter into the government and part of that discussion. So it's all very interesting. But I think in, in some way, part of what you're pointing to is um, if we discover that architecture is defined completely differently in each country according to that country's hegemonic needs, um, how do we transcend that? You know, it, or should we transcend that? You know, I, maybe those are two different questions. Um, Maybe the reason not to transcend that is for us to do our own work with our own institutions and, and work from within. But I, I, I think that we need to recognize, um, one, how embedded we are, because I think we're not conscious of that. And with that realization, come together as, as workers to really discuss what we think architecture 
is, means, can be relevant, um, can um, influence uh, larger decisions that happen at the level of the UN and then perhaps happen at the level of, of implementation, you know, within different states. Um, that has to happen and it's not happening at all except for me through through the issue of unions i don't i don't see any other vehicle that is is doing that it certainly isn't happening um with the ui the uia um the united institutes of architects you know who's where you think that might happen but its main goal is to make sure that there's transference of professional um status from one country to the other <laughs> So you end that chapter on a, a really tantalizing um, question. What would a global contemporary Siam look like? And I'm wondering what would the kind of political valency of such a kind of meeting of workers, worker to worker across the planet be? And I think you, you gesture at um, you know, the global environmental crisis as well as really big questions of social justice. So yeah, it'd be really great to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not gonna be brilliant in this, you know, one starts by thinking about what made um, Siam so significant um, in a way that we can't imagine, um, you know, the top <laughs> architectural designers um, having relevance today. Um, and I think it really does have to do with the fact that um, during that period where post-war the countries are really rebuilding um, and um, the architects are seen as having um, expertise about how that rebuilding was done. Um, they feel themselves to be important and they actually are asked to be important. So historically, it's such a different condition. So maybe to answer your question, I think the first thing to be done would be um, a sense ourselves that we matter. Um, you know, that we're doing more than chasing the next job and competing against our colleagues for, for a project. Um, and, you know, that, that certainly is the work that you're doing and certainly is the work that the lobby is doing. Um, and it is very much embedded with the idea of identifying as workers. People might think that there's a conflict between the identity of workers, you know, which doesn't um, imply Corbesque, <laughs> um, you know, genius, you know, special knowledge, but I think it's absolutely important that it begins with the identifying as worker. And then part of that would really be making sure that we speak with construction workers. Um, and so what the contemporary CM would be, would be a, um, a cooper cooperating, um, uh, organization for those of us who really build, design and build the world so that um, we would have the power to um, really stop projects that shouldn't be done um, and suggest not this, but that. We won't do this, we will do that. And this is why you should pay attention. Yeah, that's really interesting actually. Uh, we, we sort of uh, are very interested in, in this idea of thinking transversely as other workers. And that's kind of the benefit of using that word workers as soon as you can apply it to yourself and suddenly the solidarity with other workers becomes almost self-evident. But um, I'm just wondering, I, at the end of the, of the book, in your code, you begin to consider where one might go next with all the knowledge that you've laid out in, in the chapters of the book and how once you've understood the benefits of considering yourself as a worker, you know, how that connection with say construction workers as you've just said or or even workers within your own office that aren't architecturally trained uh, these connections begin to establish themselves as well as across say national boundaries so um just wondering whether we can talk a little bit about how um that term labor and the concept of work how they're very open categories that offer that potential to act not just on the workplace but on social justice more widely and our, on climate justice more widely and perhaps how we can begin to think of our own workplaces as spaces where we can exert political influence and ethical influence as you said like the decision to carry out or not carry out work i mean should that be the 
perhaps the kind of primary rights of workers to sort of um, withhold their labor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Um, yeah. I'm not sure what I can what I can add to to what to what you're saying. Um, it it is the case, and I and I say this in the introduction um, that I do see them as broad categories, and I don't in the Hannah Arendt sense want to distinguish work from from labor, you know, or have any idea of of labor being the crappy part of what we do and work being the better part of what we do. And we do need to remember that Hannah Arendt was was not juxtaposing those two to each other, but juxtaposing those to action. Um, and so it wasn't a better or worse that she was really interested in. She was in, into, I think, went more of a Marxist synthesis, you know, thesis, antithesis, synthesis, that would drive us to action um, uh, so that we would identify not primarily as laborers and not primarily as workers, but as, as public, public performers. Um, so, so when um, I think about labor um, versus work or those together, uh, work for me is very much the things that we do in our personal life. We go to work, we come home at midnight, you know, um, um, whereas labor is how that time is monetized by our nations, you know, in um, what is the role of labor in the, in the GDP? Um, and so using the word labor for me is not just a political calling to arms, um, but it's, it's a reminder that we function in the economy. <laughs> um, you know, that we're yeah, that we need to understand that whether we monetize ourselves or not, um, we're being monetized. Um, and hopefully, with that revelation, um, think more about how we want to be monetized um, and direct that trajectory. Couldn't agree more. Aska, did you want to? I guess at risk of, of sounding really trite or kind of, you know, catapulting us back into the present. present. Um, have you thought about how you sort of reassess your writing in the space of pandemic? So an immediate link to me by, might be around that really productively ambiguous framing of architectural work as immaterial labour. So in COVID, we stay away from the shared space of the studio and instead video calls and digital collaboration and coordinated BIM models, they really emphasise the virtual. So our work now takes place in a sort of virtual realm. Um, yet the physical aspect of our work has never been more present. So here I am sitting in my bedroom, disguised by this sort of handy Zoom background and work is just totally inescapable. So as we shelter in place, how do you position architecture and work or architecture and labor? It's such a good question. It's such a good question. Um, and it makes me think um, about what I think intellectually versus what I'm really experiencing. Um, I personally am someone who thinks that distance learning is good. I'm going to more meetings. I'm meeting more people. Um, you know, I, you know, I've just, the reason I was somewhat coming in at the last minute here is I'm, you know, talking to people in Brazil who are translating the work of Sergio Ferro, who who, um, whose work is very radical in relationship to what is the the work on the building site in terms of of um, political economy, essentially. Anyway, um, it's the type of thing that wouldn't happen if we were all doing meetings in person. I think it's really good in terms of education, and I hate to say this, um, because I do think that one begins to get a sense of um, identities that aren't just whether you're good in studio. I mean, I just, I hate to say it, but one of the ways that we think about ourselves within our academic context is how we, you know, shore up against um, our, our colleagues. And I think that Zoom has made us recognize that we have other intersectional conditions. Um, I see that you're in your mother's kitchen, you know, that's like, that's, that's interesting. Um, or that you're in an Indian reservation. Um, so I think it helps break open a certain clubbiness um, that we have, not just as students, but whatever. 
but around the more personal thing that you're asking about how it's affected my writing, I do think that there is a, uh, an intellectual benefit that comes from going to more meetings, meeting more people. Um, and I'm so often taking notes from these meetings, like, I need to put that in the paper. Hadn't thought about that for the paper. <laughs> Get that in there. Um, on the other hand, it is the case that I am staying in my head a whole lot um, and that I can make myself run around in circles, you know, and just as I'm describing, it's like, take that note and put that in that paper. But you know, I don't know where to put that in the paper. Maybe that's the next paper, write another paper. You know, it's like, whoa. Um, <laughs> so anyway. Thanks for that. Um, maybe it's time and we could keep talking for, for hours because we have plenty more questions, but maybe we should take a few from the audience. So um, there's been some written in the chat. I don't know if maybe um, if you want to unmute yourself and ask the question uh, directly. Maybe Oscar, you were first to say something there or Sean. Um, this is Sean. I was willing to let Oscar go first, but I don't hear well, You're there now, so let's hear it from you. Thanks. Right. Um, well, before I ask the question, I just wanted to say how utterly brilliant what you guys are doing is with the formation of this union. It's uh, a really revolutionary thing. And, um, you know, as somebody who has been fortunate enough to have a fairly successful career in architecture, but he came from a very working class background with uh, my, my parents with tr strong trade unions. And it, it's just very kind of weird because it, it never occurred to me as I was a, when I was a student uh, or even perhaps during my, my career that, that architects should be unionized. So I just think it's absolutely brilliant. Now, it was kind of slightly amusing to hear Peggy describe the RIBA as a union. <laughs> I can't imagine anything less like a union. I didn't mean to imply that. Did I imply that? <laughs> I think you said it, but I think you meant it in a way that it was the representative body um, that should act like a, uni a union, but it right. uh, doesn't. But um, what I wanted to ask is the, the issues that were being discussed tonight. Um, how, how do you all think that this should inform the content of architectural education? Because a lot of the issues that you're talking about are rooted, or the attitudes, the, the development of the architectural self is rooted in the way that we educate. Uh, and how does that play out, do you think, particularly in the design project uh, and, in, and in theory itself? I, I just wanted to, if you had some thoughts on that, uh, all of you. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll start. Um... The lobby is actually putting together um, a summer school of architecture, which we see as a kind of beta test of, of a new school, you know, whole, whole cloth. Um, and um, we've made the decision to not organize it around studio slash design, history, theory, structures, mechanical engineering, but to have it relate to um, themes um, so that in some way from the start, you know that your, um, your learning and your outputs will be directed to an issue that's relevant in the world. Um, land, territory, um, environment, um, governance, um, and Within that, students will be asked to present things to have outputs, which we could call design, but are probably designed, but try to avoid what design traditionally means, which is plans, you know, elevations, you know, sketches, um, but that that output, output could take any form. It could be a poem, it could be a manifesto, it could be a chart, it could be an analysis of of um, an organization um, so that one can think about 
imagination and creativity, those things that are kind of wrapped up in design, um, not, not in the traditional way, but in a larger imaginary. Um, but I mean, the, the goal is to not assume that when the student graduates and go out in the world, they'll figure out how to um, mobilize their work in a relevant way. Um, the relevance is foregrounded and the mechanisms are then supporting that. And just to make another link back to your book, Peggy, um, in your research about um, face at the American kind of architectural workers union, uh, I was really intrigued by the idea that they set up a federation technical school in New York in the 40s and it was explicitly with that project to kind of combat elitism so it's not just I guess the content of education but but the mode which is really really powerful. Exactly, exactly. Um, you know what's interesting what, what was isn't in there is that that school actually became um, continued and was was I don't want to say reduced, but took on the role of um, preparing architects for the exam. And I, I went to that school, um, and you know we could we could say that that is a, a, a reduction or whatever, but it's it still is a holdout of the idea of helping people um, get to a place where they have economic stability, um, and you know it's. Yeah, it's important to think about about that. And you know, just to elaborate, that has to do with making a less expensive education, <laughs> for sure. Um, maybe we have time for a few more questions from from the audience. Uh, Carolina, did you want to say yours out loud? Well, I could, but then I could continue speaking. <laughs> um, isn't it clear the questions? I, I wanted to ask, first I wanted to greet Aska, uh, who I met in Prague two years ago. Hi Aska. And thanks everyone for the talk, I really enjoyed it. Uh, my question was uh, whether, because I, uh, I like the idea of the ethics actually most, uh, um, about the whole unionization and so on, and that we could uh, empower, or that the architects and other workers could empower and uh, use this power to decide what should be built or what shouldn't be built. But and uh, as Perl mentioned as well, there was this uh, movement or uh, petition to uh, to prevent building prisons. Uh, but won't there, there always be someone who will be actually willing to do that? I mean, it, it and as Perl also asked, uh, it won't work completely, not. We can, we can sign different uh, papers. I know that, for example, Leopold Lambert from France, uh, the, the editor, uh, chief editor of uh, the Phonambulist also made some petitions against building prisons. Uh, but it's a voluntarily activity of the architects or voluntarily decisions whether the individual person wanna build or not build the prison. So there will be always someone who will in the end build it or not. What do you think? Thanks. I assume you're asking. Well, I mean, maybe I'll, I'll start try responding. I mean, uh, Peggy, feel free to respond. By the way, if you um, have some. <laughs> I was. I suppose that the, the the condition that you're describing is 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 essentially why we're in the situation in the first place. That, it, that there's something about the competitive nature about the way that we work that means that it's 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 always brought back to the lowest common denominator. <clears throat> but it's it, it's also like this probably because um because we feel we need to um do whatever it takes to say ret retain our jobs for example so in, in a way to to think transversely and to and sort of build solidarity networks to understand that actually when you're accepting to do something uh as an individual it actually has a wider effect on all your peers uh across your industry for example um, every time you decide to work for free, for example, for an architect, it means that uh, bosses kind of um, get more power in uh, hiring people for free in the future. So there's definitely a notion of a, <clears throat> of a wider consciousness that needs to be developed. But um, it's, um, 
it's 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 you know I, th I think I think the work of unionizing is about kind of having these discussions and I suppose um, building that awareness that means that maybe workers think twice before making making these sorts of decisions. Oh, sorry, I forgot to mention that um, one of the main arguments is that if if there is a discussion among architects and raised awareness against what or on what is not or ought not to be built, then maybe it will be built by worse architects and, and it will end up as a worse design. So that was also one of my um, issue, um, actually how to, how, to, how to get from the trap. Uh, so, yeah, I suppose it, it goes back to that argument of, of I think the competitive nature of the environment that we all work in. Um, and it's about, it's about a culture change out of that, I think. That's, that's kind of the big project, I think, uh, for some of us at least, is to, to think about what, what sort of architectural profession or, or wider world do we want to live in, I suppose, and, and what, what kind of cultural shift do we need in order to never be in that position to think, well, I might as well do it, even if it's a prison that's going like, to you know, kill a forest or something, just because somebody else might do it if I don't. You know, it's, it's interesting. I, I... I think um, that there would be consequence if, for example, architects could convince the AIA to come out ethically and saying, you can't build prisons and you can't build detention centers, which they will never do. But you know, we're just imagining one puts pressure on that. And then, and then we wonder who will build them. You know? um, and it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't be architectural professionals because they would be um, given sanctions, you know, they'd be reprimanded by the AIA, you know, take your stamp away, whatever. So the people who would do it would be, um, you know, some, some kind of engineering construction uh, uh, condition. Um, but, but then, you know, it begins to put pressure on the larger system um, that, um, that indicates only the scrum will do this, you know, and I and I think that that begins to have um, implications, uh, you know, with with the larger um, prison detention center industry. Um, so should we take one more question, or are we running out of time? Yeah, please go for it. Okay. Um, who was next? So I think Pearl, we discussed uh, prisons. Um, uh, Matthew, would you like to speak out your question? If not, Ella. I'm happy to go if Matthew isn't, or were you about to? Sure, no. Um, yeah, so um, you've spoken about how obviously theory is a really important backbone to all of this, but um, I guess we're currently sitting here as sort of a room um, full of architectural workers. And um, I wondered what you felt we should, um, as individuals in this room, um, go away um, and do to turn that into action, um, like something that we could do tomorrow, um, sort of to, I guess, close maybe, or to sort of wrap up what you've been talking about. Um, how do we go and talk to, you know, inculcate this idea that we are workers and that we're not sort of um, professionals who are separate from, from the concerns of workers? Talk to everybody you know and get together. Whether get together, you know, means on a Zoom call um, is how the lobby got started. You know, I, I was having enough incidental conversations with people that I recognized that what I was thinking about, which is, why are architects all miserable and why aren't we talking about it? Um, um, enough people who agreed with that, you know, it's like, let, let's get together and talk. It, it very much has to do with, with collectivizing um, and, and recognizing that the thoughts that you have are shared um, and that people have thought about it in different ways and can elaborate your thinking about it. Um, I don't know what the situation is, you know, for you as a student or as a, as an employee, but um, from that kind of collective discussion, um, ask people who are in a position to 
change your circumstances or listen to you complain about your circumstances or take advice about your circumstances, um, that that's not an individual effort. Um, it, it really has to do with recognizing that you form a larger group of like-minded people um, than, than you might realize um, at, at the moment. Yeah, totally echo what Peggy's saying. Start by kind of, yeah, asking a question and listening, whether that's your work colleague or if you don't have any work colleagues and you're a freelancer, ask a friend. Um, and I think that touches on Matthew's point as well on this inherent issue of individualism in the profession, just by kind of breaking down that boundary of um, the things that we individually suffer at work is, is really, really powerful. And then you can, from that, sort of decide what you want to do about it together. Also, join UVW Soul. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, they're, you know, they're, <laughs> they're there. Um, they've done, they've done the groundwork. <laughs> um, can I just say one more thing about that, you know, in relationship to Matthew's question about individualism? Um, I don't think architecture is about individualism. If, if you really think about work in the office, it takes such a team. And it's only this idea, you know, going back to Sean's question about design that has set up design and hence our thinking design is the uber thing that defines an architect. Um, it's only an idea of design as in individual that puts that label on architecture. It's, it's teamwork. It's just naturally teamwork. Um, and if we didn't have the idea from design as individual, um, we wouldn't be thinking of it as, an, as a profession about individualism.